What do we do with the conditional conjunction if, as found in Colossians 1.23, 1 John 2.24, and many more? And if you want me to read, I can read 1 Colossians 1.23. Uh, it reads, yes. uh, well, let me read 21 through 23. It just flows better. Uh, it says, and you who once were alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now he is reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and blameless and above reproach in his sight. If indeed you continue in the faith, grounded and steadfast and not, and are not moved away from the hope of the gospel, which you heard, which was preached to every creature under heaven, of which I, Paul, became a minister. All right, well, let's deal with that one first. If can mean a lot of things. It's conditional. All right. The if here is also conditional. But is he saying to an individual that you will only be saved or stay saved if you don't move away? No. He's speaking to a collective group as Gentiles in general from what I remember, because he's reminding them that Israel tried to obtain it as it were by works of the law, and they sought it not by faith. And so because they rejected Christ, they were cut off. But if they believe, they'll be grafted back in again. And it's a warning to Gentiles that the Gentiles will be blameless as long as they believe the gospel. It's just a warning to uh, Gentiles in general. Here it is. Um, that's how I know that. It says, because from here, he's talking about uh, two being one. The Jews and the Gentiles are now one new man in Christ, right? So let's go up a little further. Uh, that quote is from Colossians uh, 1, 23. So, it says, for by him were all things created that are in heaven, that are in earth, visible and invisible. And he mentions them. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. Right. Then and having made peace through the blood of his cross by him to reconcile all things to himself. By him, I say, whether they be things on earth or things in heaven. And you, Gentiles, that were sometimes alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now has he reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and unblameable and re unreprovable in his sight if you continue in the faith ground and settle. So there's two things here I see. One is that he's speaking to Gentiles. See, you guys were alienated um, and Gentiles can be reconciled if they believe, right? But this is to save people. So what's the condition here? That they will be without, uh, I think, reproof or correction, right? So it says, and you that were sometimes alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now has he reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and unblameable and reprovable in his sight. Right? Unreprovable without correction. Okay? So the warning here is to the church, don't move away from the truth, the simplicity of the gospel because then you're going to be reprovable. You're going to need correction because it says uh, present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable. If you continue in the faith ground and settled and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel, which you have heard and which was preached to every creature, whereof I, Paul, am made a minister. So there's two things here. One is they will be unreprovable as long as they don't move away from this hope. But secondly, it's a it's a corporal like you, as in Gentiles, right? He mentions this in another place that the Jews, uh, if they would just believe, they'd be grafted back in. But they rejected Christ, and he makes the same warning to them. But you'll be cut off too if speaking to Gentile nations, not an individual. So what's the other one he gave? John, first John, what? Oh, 
Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, these are, we, we said last week, if you want to look at last week's stuff, they went out from us. They were not really of us. Uh, that's uh, talking about apostles, false apostles that now had held to an antichrist view. This is not uh, believers that uh, had a faith crisis or anything. These people never believed. They See, there was a lot of people that were followers of Jesus. They follow him around, right? But you'll notice where when he started talking about drinking his blood and stuff, they're like, this is too hard for us to hear. And they left. They, they were never believers. They never trusted who Christ was. They didn't realize he was the divine son of God or any of that. And so they were disciples in the sense that they followed him, right? But when it got too difficult, they just fell away. They were never saved. And, and right here is about uh, uh, these guys. They, they went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they'd been of us, they would no doubt have continued with us. He's talking about us, the apostles. Ben mentioned that last week us being the apostles, uh, speaking of John and these guys, but they went out that they might be made manifest. They were not all of us. So these were false apostles. And right before this verse, it says, um, little children, it's the last time. And as you've heard, antichrist shall come. Even now there are many antichrists whereby we know it's the last time they went out. They went out from us. So these, these people that went out from them were antichrists. So uh, it has nothing to do with an actual believer. Um, conditional here, uh, the, the verses are speaking to corporate uh, units as Gentiles as a whole. But also the thing here is not uh, if you don't remain grounded and settled in the gospel, you will lose your salvation. That's not what it's saying. Uh, it's saying that Gentiles have to believe. See, if they forget what the, if the Colossians forget what the gospel is or they move away from it, the Gentile people, they won't continue to hear the gospel uh, and they won't be able to be saved. But if these people that are already saved, they will not be without correction, unreprovable in his sight. Um, this is a temporal, a temporal blamelessness in the church. It's not their eternal standing, but a temporal standing uh, uh, that's going on that he's speaking about. Oh, that was really, really excellent. Uh, uh, Brother Ben, uh, we talked about this before we went live and, and you said this first question was really easy. So let me, let me hear it. Make it easy for me. Well, I, I, I again, I, I... You know, I, I can't wait until we get to these epistles because I, I, you know, each one of these epistles, especially these more difficult ones like First John, Hebrews, etc., are the ones again I mentioned I study the most on. I feel like I, I have the best understanding of. Um, but you know, I know early on this is this is a. So forgive me if I come off a little strong, but this is a. But I don't think it's unwarranted, because I knew early on is that you know anyone with. Uh, ears to hear and eyes to see would know that uh, the Bible clearly teaches grace through faith alone. So anyone who tries to add works or back load or front load uh, would be exposed very easily. But I also knew that if, if Satan couldn't use that tactic, uh, his next attack would be to attack faith itself. And um, there are many who attack faith itself to, to, to uh, they again they elevate themselves and, and trust in their own flesh they're, that they have no doubts that they're they know they're going to continue to believe all their lives they they know the future they know that they're never there's nothing ever going to going to deceive them and so uh they they can never stop believing and um and uh, again so they, they they like they love these verses they love these find these verses and they they think that they approves their case when it really uh, if you study it it shows that they know nothing they know nothing about uh, God's grace, and and that gr we're not saved by our perpetual faith. We're kept by the power of God, His keeping, through faith. faith gr uh, God does not put believers on probation to say, "Oh, are you going to continue in good works, or are you going to continue in the faith?" It's a uh, it, it, salvation is an event. Get that through your head. Uh, it's an event, not a process. It's not a probation. The moment you believe, you're born again. And to prove that in, in the first Colossians 1 23 here, um, again, I could go on all day about this. Um, but again, let's read the let's read the verse carefully. And you you who were once alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now he has reconciled 
in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy, blameless, and above reproach in his sight, if indeed you continue in the faith, grounded and steadfast, and are not moved away from the hope of the gospel which you heard, which was preached to every creature under heaven, which I, Paul, became a minister. Okay, so righteousness or right standing with God under the old covenant, again, not it, and again, it was a temporal, uh, to have a right standing with God in, in the um, in the old covenant through works, what did you have to do? You had to be obedient to the terms of the covenant. And what were the terms of the covenant? Well, there are 613 laws. What's, what's, what do you have to be, and so to be blameless under the old covenant, you had to be, uh, you had to follow the 613 laws, essentially. Um, again, no one did it. Um, but, but, uh, again, that's what, that's how you essentially had to be blameless in his sight uh, and above reproach in his sight is to keep those, that, that covenant and no one could. Yeah. So how, so how would you become blameless and reproach in his sight under the new covenant? Where, well, what are the terms of the new covenant to continue to believe, to, to have faith alone in Christ alone as your, as your perfect sacrifice, as your, as your life. He is our life. Your, your life is hidden in him. So, so again, this is not, this question is about being, uh, okay. So Lord, Lord is the, notice the blamelessness. It says the, the, the blamelessness is in this passage is quote, in his sight, which indicates a contemporaneous evaluation. Whereas other verses like first Corinthians, the blamelessness is in reference to the day of our Lord Jesus Christ which is after the res resurrection, and I believe that's at the Bema, when we, we are going to be evaluated by him. So again, in 1 Corinthians 1, 4, 4 through 9, notice the distinction. It says, in his sight, in the day of the Lord. And so uh, 1 Corinthians uh, verse chapter 1, verse 4 through 9, it says, I thank my God always concerning you for the grace of God, which was given to you by Christ Jesus, that you were enriched in everything by him in all utterance and all knowledge, even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you, as you, as so you come short in no gift, eagerly awaiting the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ, who will also confirm you to the end, that you may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful by whom you were called into the fellowship of His Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. So again, in that in that verse, the the blamelessness is again. It's 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 a promise by God because of His faithfulness. God is faithful uh, 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 in the day of, in the day of Lord Jesus Christ when you are revealed uh, as righteous. God will confirm you blameless, like holy. You you'll receive His. You have already received His imputed righteousness, but at that point, the, the sin will be completely absent from you. You there'll be no sin in in you or among you. Um, so and again, I think the context is very important. The in your sight in this. For in this passage, First Corinthians or Colossians is in his sight contemporaneously, as long as you hold uh, fast to the gospel. Because if you lose uh, lose your faith, or you 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 become not not lose your faith, but you become um, well, it, it, essentially yes. If you lose your faith and you you become unconvinced or uh, no longer uh, have confidence in the gospel, uh, in your sight, God's evaluation in the contemporaneous is you will be blameless. You 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 fail to. Uh, persevere in the faith again. It's not going to it has nothing whatsoever to do with your eternal salvation because in the very first in the verse just prior to that he says you already have been reconciled to God. So reconciled is a permanent thing. The in his sight in verse twenty two refers to what God sees in the believer right now rather than the be believer's future standing in glory in heaven. You know, so I think it's critical to note that the reconciliation of verse 21 refers to a past event that has already transpired. The verb reconciled is in the aorist tense and, and an indicative mood, indicating that Paul viewed the Colossian believers as already having been reconciled to God. And so you see the grammatical shift before, between verse 22 and 23, the grammatical shift from the past tense accomplishments of verses 20 through 21 to the Lord's present purposes for each believer. So again, it's it's about uh, the, the uh, Colossians 1.23 is about the believer's present state or condition before God rather than his spiritual, eternal, settled standing and position in Christ. 
Uh, and again, I think the context proves that out. Um, and I can, I can say much more about that. Um, and if anyone's more interested in that, I would be happy to go into much more detail. Uh, there's so much more I could say on that. With regards to uh, 1 John 2.24, talks about they went from us because they were not of us. We talked about that last week. Uh, in fact, I clipped out a video, a separate segment for that. The the I think I labeled the uh, clip um, does 1 John 2.24, or 2.19 I think it was, teach that... In Romans 2, do those teach that a, a, a salvation or preservate perseverance of the saints? Does it, do those verses teach that? And I think we all, R Renee, Luke, myself, all did a great job of exposing that. That no, uh, uh, 1 John 2.24 is, let me just pull it up here, make sure I'm, I'm thinking of the right verse. Um, oh, yes. It says, therefore, let that, that abide in you, which you heard from the beginning, that if what you heard from the beginning abides in you, you will also abide in the Son and the Father. And again, that's exactly what the that first John is about abiding. It's not about eternal salvation. It's about abiding, continuing in the in the in truth and faith. Because they this te the first John was about uh agnostic false teachers coming in, denying the that Christ came in the flesh, and also teaching that good and evil were symbiotic. That there was both good and evil in Christ, there's both good and evil in man, and there's both good and evil in God. And that's why you see these stark contrasts in, in uh, John roundly uh, condemning these false teachings. That that's where you see verses like, in him there's, in him he, you know, he is light and in him there's no darkness at all. He who is born of God does not sin. He cannot sin because these are true. God is perfect and righteous and holy and when we're born again of the new seed, uh, our that, that seed abides in us forever, and we cannot sin as that new man. But we also have an old man, and that old man can sin. And these false teachers were trying to teach that, oh, no, uh, the darkness and light can coexist. They held to a false gospel, and the us and the we, uh, in the, and when it talks about, you know, they, they went out from us, the us there are the apostles who... Again, who had touched Christ, seen Christ, handled the word of truth as he opens the epistle with. Um, and again, so it, it's all about abiding. Again, abiding is about continuing in the truth, staying in the light, uh, not being drawn away by false teaching, which could, which could seriously compromise uh, your relationship and intimacy, uh, and which, I, again, is another word for fellowship, essentially. And that's what First John is all about, abiding in the light. So, and he confirms that. He says that the light, you know, the truth abides in you, but you, because you have the Holy Spirit sealed forever, but now you, it's up to you to abide, you yourself abide in that light. Because again, you have two natures. You can choose to abide in the new nature, or you can choose to abide in the old nature. These things are not difficult, and anyone who continues to say these things, um, it's one thing to be confused, that's okay, but accept correction when, when, it, when correction has been given. Um, and you know, what I'm saying here should bring, I think should bring great joy to people to be liberated of this false teaching that you must continue to believe. And if you slip up or you have episodes of doubt, then you were not saved. That is completely yep. false. That's demonic. It's satanic. It's antichrist. And I'm not afraid to say it. And so, and uh, it'll make you look at yourself every time. Right. And it, it'll actually make your faith shaken. It's absolutely. Uh, I want to support you on your uh, the Gnostic false teaching about the darkness and light. You can see that represented in the yin yang single uh, symbol of Confucianism and Taoism and Buddhism. The black and white yin yang symbol that is a common false teaching in pagan religions. The darkness and light balance. I just wanted to support you on that. Hmm. Okay. Well, I want to support both of you on your answers. Uh, you did an excellent job. Now, the, the question originally came in from uh, TJ Breen. TJ's in the chat room now, so hello, TJ. Now, when he first sent us the question several weeks ago, um, he uh, then followed up with a, a second email uh, to clarify something. Now, I've had to when we get questions that are uh, elaborate uh, or lengthy, it, we're ne it's necessary for us to edit to, and try to make it simple, uh, simpler, and also uh, uh, to for because of the space required and also uh, 
the time and to try to make it as simple as possible. Uh, but um, one of the points that TJ made in his follow-up question is that, uh, well, let me, let me uh, connect this thought to, to, to the answer. Um, you've heard me talk about uh, Bible Jim uh, numerous times. Um, he, he's been for many, many years uh, one of the leaders of the, the street preachers of America. And uh, he and I became close friends and worked together closely for years. And he was at my home Bible study for, for many years. And um, he wrote several books uh, and uh, asked me to edit his books. So I, I, mind, I know his uh, doctrines, and he's one of the three preachers that believes the real gospel. But uh, he was one of these people that uh, when he came to something in the Bible that stumped him, he stopped right there. Uh, he would not go forward any further. And uh, he called me. He called uh, maybe a half dozen other people all over the country uh, that he's known for many years that he respects them and that, that wants to get everybody's thoughts on it until he feels like he's got it. He understands it and has, has the right answer. So I've always admired that about him because I've taken the opposite approach. Uh, if, if it's a there, if it's a problem, I, I I don't have to get to the bottom of it right now. Uh, I'll, I'll just continue studying and reading, and I'll get. I, I say I'll get to that eventually. So I'm pretty, kind of guilty of not uh, uh, stopping and trying to get the answer uh, right now. Um, but we do have Ben did an excellent job. Uh, but th this is Renee's uh, strength. This is her. Matter of fact, this is why we. Um, we have given her the moniker, the untwisted sister, uh, b because she savers and, and she's probably better at it than anybody I've ever encountered at taking the problem versus these, these kinds of questions and untwisting them and clarifying them. And both uh, Ben and Renee on this particular, these two verses, by the way, um, TJ gave us more than two verses. Maybe he gave us four or five or six verses and he said, there's many more. Um, so, but uh, what, what Renee and Ben did was they went specifically to each of these verses and looked at the context. And that's that's the right way to, to, to deal with it. And, and you saw that when they went to the context, there was a good answer, a good explanation that uh, resolved the problem, I think. Uh, but TJ's really question is, is broader. Uh, and, and that is this word if uh, it, it means there's a, it doesn't it mean that there's a con, it's conditional um, well obviously you can go to each verse that has if in it and deal with it independently and and go to the context um, Bible Jim the reason I brought him up is because he was all excited one day he called me up and said oh, I got it I got it it's it uh, I found out that if should be understood as since instead of if. And he just, he was so happy that he got an answer. But I said to him, Jim, I, I, I don't get it. Uh, even if we change the word if to since, how does that change the, uh, the, the problem? Because uh, whether it's if or since, it's still saying that, that one thing depends on the other. So uh, I didn't think that ch changing it to since but he says that that is a, 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 a theologians have, have come up with that as the as the answer. Uh, but my answer is this: I, I would say that uh, I'll fall back on the answer that you hear me say so often. And Ben addressed the the, the question uh, initially in that way, and that is that my question to everybody is: Do you believe this is true? Do you believe this is the word of God? Uh, do you believe that? It's inerrant. Uh, well, um, do, do you believe it has contradictions in it? I don't. I, I don't think there's contradictions. I think if we can come across something that is an, is an apparent contradiction, an apparent problem, that uh, it, it just means that we, we haven't yet re resolved it. We, uh, me personally, I don't understand the answer. I don't understand it well enough yet. But at some point, with help from others, or maybe the Lord revealing something to me, uh, eventually I'll understand it. Uh, but 
there can't be a contradiction. There can't be error. It's the word of God. Uh, so uh, what really this all he really hinges upon is, uh, is it true that um, the only condition for salvation is faith in, in, in the person and finished work of Christ and his promise to us? That, that's the only condition. You know, Calvinists, they say there's unconditional election that uh, you don't even have that as a condition. Faith is not a condition because, because God just um, regenerates you and makes you believe, so it's not even up to you to, 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 to believe. But Calvinism is horribly wrong. It's the most evil philosophy ever invented from the minds of men. Uh, so there is a condition for salvation, and that is we must believe. But... We only need to believe in order to be regenerated because this, as Ben says, this is an event. It, uh, the best example in the Bible, of course, is Jesus talking, comparing it to being born physically. When, when I was born physically and I came out of my mother's womb, I was born and I, 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 could, I was identified as a human being. And nothing could ever change my status or standing. Luke's a human being. Uh, no matter what I do in my life, uh, nothing will change that status. Uh, and it doesn't depend upon uh, anything that's ongoing in my life. It was just an event. I, it happened. I was born. I'm a human being. Well, when we're born again, spiritually, it's the same thing. As soon as we're born again, uh, we're, our standing, our status is uh, born again as a child of God. And, and nothing we do from that point forward can change that standing or, or status. Uh, uh, so uh, all that's required is initial faith. If we have any crisis of faith as the years go on, uh, or if we fall into error, these things do not change our standing as a born-again child of God. So if that is the case, and we all agree that that is, uh, then these problem verses like if, well, hey, the verse says if in it, that means it's conditioned. You know, your your salvation will be conditioned upon you continuing to do this or that. Well, um, okay, there is an answer. If you ask Ben or Renee, I'm sure they can uh, uncover it for you. They'll go to the context and they'll dig and they'll, they'll figure it out. Uh, but if you ask me, uh, I'll, I'll say, do you believe this? <laughs> do you believe this is the word of God? Do you believe it's inerrant? Do you believe that when you're born again, you're a child of God and you're promised eternal, eternal life? Uh, if you believe those things, then don't let these problems, if between the time you identify a verse as a problem, whether it's a, the conditional if conjunction or, or whether it's some other problem, uh, don't let that problem uh, affect you because all it means is that you don't know the answer yet. But uh, the answer you should be relying upon is, this is the word of God. Brother Luke, yeah. I, I want to summarize what every one of us have said, if you don't mind, because I think this might be helpful. Yeah, what please. I will say is, every one of us said something I want to condense here. Uh, you know, originally we were given the question, I didn't have the verse in front of me. I thought it was the corporal entity of the Gentiles and the Jews. And I thought it was referring to the Jews being not grafted in. Now that I see this, it's they are temporally uh, without reproof or correction. So uh, Brother Luke pointed out, once we're born of God, we're born into God's family. That cannot be undone. We know that. So the next step is we're, we often divide the word by, is this salvation or discipleship? Is this the old covenant or the new covenant? To whom is he speaking? About what? What are we being saved from? Is it temporal or is it earthly? So now we're going to look at this and say, now, is this, if, is this condition based on something earthly or temporal that we receive, or is it something based eternally that we receive? Well, we've been pointed out, we've been reconciled to God. It said right here, you were already reconciled to God. Now, what is the condition? There is a condition, but it's not to keep your salvation. All right. We, we cannot read into scripture what is not there. So uh, what it says, and you 
that were sometime alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. Now, here's the condition. If you continue in the faith, grounded and settled, and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel, which you have heard and which was preached to every creature which is under heaven, where I, whereof I, Paul, am made a minister. Now, first of all, does it say that you will no longer have your permanent position in Christ? No, it doesn't. It says, present you holy, unblameable, and unreprovable. Well, our permanent position is in Christ. He is without sin. He is without blame. That doesn't change because we are in Christ. We are resting in his merits, not our own. So us uh, falling into error or messing up uh, or, or having a faith crisis, that doesn't change our permanent position in Christ. But what it does change is our temporal, earthly situation. Well, if we move away from the truth of the gospel, will we be without reproof and unblameable in the sight of God on an earthly scale? No, we won't. Temporally, we will need reproof and correction. And we are to be blamed because we've left the hope of the gospel. But it doesn't mean that our permanent position changes. It means our temporal, earthly situation changes. So uh, in this situation, uh, a lot of what's happening, so Paul gives correction and instruction to these people. It is never to threaten them that their salvation is resting on their own soul, uh, shoulders, that they can be unborn of God, that they can lose their salvation if they have a faith crisis. Even when we believe not, yet he abides faithful, can't deny himself. Ben even quoted, who will confirm you till the end. So it is God that preserves us, keeps us, kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last day. So it's not us. The whole point of this is you rest in Christ, knowing the truth of your identity in him. Now, your life has temporal earthly consequences for everything. But knowing you're secure in Christ. See, people think if you're constantly worried, you might lose it. You got to fight to keep your faith and fight to keep your doctrine correct, or you're going to get in trouble and he's going to forsake you, or you're going to forfeit your salvation. That never helps. It never helps you grow. Why? Because your foundation is partly on you. And that is what the enemy wants to do. He wants your foundation to crumble. Your foundation needs to be on Jesus and what he did alone. You don't have faith in your faith. You don't have faith in your ability to keep your faith. You don't have faith in any of that. You have faith in the Savior. And whatever you're struggling with, we have these epistles to help us stay grounded and stay settled in the truth of the gospel so that we can be without blame and without reproof, unreprovable in his sight, temporally, earthly. We don't, you know, our position in Christ eternally never changes, but our earthly walk with him and our, uh, uh, how we're doing, um, outside of that, like temporally in our life, that does change. And that is conditional based upon staying grounded and settled. You being blameless and unreprovable in his sight temporally is conditional upon you remaining in the truth of the gospel. Otherwise, you will need correction and reproof. I hope you guys can see the difference. All of us said some of that, but I wanted to put it all together. Uh, so. I, I guess people try to shake you up by showing you these verses, thinking that's going to help you not lose your faith, but it doesn't. It's a spirit of fear and it's not of God. So if you ever see things like that, that go against God's promise, then you need to go to God and say, Hey, what are they talking about here? Because I know you don't lie, Lord. I can know I have eternal life. So what does this mean? And he will show you. It doesn't always happen right away, but 
he will show you. And Paul even said, you know, I have fought the good fight. I have kept the faith. It was a struggle. It, keeping the faith it can be a struggle sometimes. It, 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 again, there's all kinds of false doctrine, uh, things that can distract us. And so he fought for it. It was, he, it was a work in, in that respect to keep the faith. And that's why they're exhorted over and over again to, uh, you know, remain to the faith. Um, so, yeah. So it, it's it, we're not saved by our our perpetual continuing faith. And if, if we lose faith, it doesn't mean that you're never saved. Uh, now, now, if you lose faith, that by all means, uh, that's a terrible, hopeless place to be in. Um, you know, emotionally. Um, and so I, I, yeah, so I would always, I, all of us would encourage people not to lose faith and that we should try to grow our faith and build our faith. And that's why Paul, Peter says, build yourself up in your most holy faith so that you will never stumble. Uh, and so, and the stumbling there is not just, you know, it, it's really falling into false doctrine. Um, so I think, I think it's a, again, it's a, it's a struggle that we all, uh, you know, anyone who says that they don't struggle with their faith, um, I don't think that it, it, that may be true, but there's no guarantee that that will ever be the case. And so um, I think a lot of people, people who don't tend to look down on other people um, and even question their salvation, which is really disturbing because that breaks fellowship and uh, it, it's all kinds of problems. So uh, I, I wanted to clarify too, TJ, I was not referring to you when I said people try to shake people's faith. I, I didn't mean that. I, I didn't mean you personally were bringing us this question to stir. You have an honest question. And I, I'm so grateful that you sent it in. So please don't think when I said that I was referring to you. I wasn't. I was saying that there are those that try to come against our blessed assurance in Christ. They will come at you and say, you can lose your salvation if you don't do X, Y, and Z. Look at this verse. And they try to tear you down because they think that if you have eternal security, you'll just do whatever you want and you won't and you won't be scared enough to keep your salvation. And they're not doing anybody a favor. So I wasn't talking about you or this being your motive. I promise you I was not. I'm sorry if, if it felt that way. I am grateful and I will never put anybody down for sending us a question. Half the questions that are sent to us are by, they've heard these questions from people that don't believe the gospel. And so they're repeating the question to bring to us. Hey, what about this? I've heard this argument. So I'm not fussing at the questioner for bringing the question. I'm grateful for the questions. And please believe me when I say I was not referring to you on that. I'm actually glad you brought the question to us. <laughs> 